Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and um, today I'll give you some announcements. We have a lot of things coming up uh, in just a couple weeks. The Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course starts. That's our fall session for health professionals and anybody who wants to take it. Doctors get 39 CMEs, nurses get 39 CEs, dietitians get 39 CEs. This is a chance to learn really good stuff and still get your continuing education credits. But those of you who aren't health professionals, you can take this course too. And as usual, we have a package with Diet Lifestyle and some of our certification courses. And remember, I'm getting ready to teach one of those certification courses live in September, the autism course. I'm gonna teach it through boot camp. Everybody likes the Friday night, Saturday afternoon thing. So we're gonna do that with autism and then I'll put it on a video platform. Um, how and why to, or why and how to withdraw from psychiatric drugs starts October 3rd. So uh, we've already started to enroll people. That's very exciting. This is the first course of its kind that's ever been taught in an institution like the Wellness Forum Institute. So if you're interested in information about that, let me know. And also careers. Some of you are starting to contact me and say, hey, you know, I've been an accountant for all my adult life, but I'm thinking I might like to do something in the health business. What are my options? And I'm happy to have a conversation with you about it sometime if you'd like to. Um, we need more people talking about this, and there's room for so many people with so many different scopes of practice and, and uh, opportunities to share with others. So my email address is pampopper at msn.com, and if any of this stuff sounds interesting to you, send me an email. We'll chat about it, okay? All right. Um, I have a couple topics to talk about today, and I never miss an opportunity to talk about exercise because I think people should do more of it. So anytime I can show people a lot of scientific evidence that this is really, really good for you, I try to do that. So adopting an optimal, optimal diet is an important strategy for preventing and reversing type 2 diabetes. And you've heard me talk about that. There's a great deal of research to show, support that, but so is exercise. First, exercise helps people to lose weight, and weight gain is one of the primary risk factors for developing type 2 diabetes and body accumulation of body fat. But exercise also addresses many of the mechanisms of insulin resistance, such as accumulation of fat and skeletal muscle, production of inflammatory markers which interfere with insulin signaling and oxidative stress. And exercise results in muscle contraction, which actually uh, increases glucose uptake. A significant and growing body of research supports the use of exercise as an important part of a treatment plan for diabetics. One study involving 17 sedentary type 2 diabetics who just did six weeks of whole body resistance training resulted in improved glycemic control, increased lean muscle mass, reductions in fasting triglycerides, total cholesterol, advanced glycation end products, and body fat. A significant relationship between increased muscle mass and reduction of fasting glucose levels and hemoglobin A1c was also noted. A randomized controlled trial involving older men recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes showed that resistance training twice per week for 16 weeks resulted in a 46.3% increase in insulin sensitivity, 7.1% reduction in fasting blood glucose levels, and significant loss of visceral fat. Acts pretty fast to solve your problems. A meta-analysis of 27 studies that looked at the effect of exercise on glucose control and the risk of complications of diabetes concluded that all forms of exercise have an effect on A1C levels similar to diet, drugs, and insulin treatments. However, many studies show that if you do a combination of aerobic and resistance training, the effect is much more um, uh, intense. A meta-analysis of 27 studies that looked at the effect of exercise on glucose control and the risk of complications of diabetes concluded that any form of exercise you're willing to engage in can have an effect of an A1C level similar to diet, drugs, and insulin treatments. However, many studies show that a combination of both aerobic and resistance training is more effective for glucose control and calorie burning than either form of exercise that you do by itself. But, but what these studies continue to show, and I have more of them to share with you, is start moving do anything and it starts to get better. One study showed that adding aerobic exercise to resistance training improves glucose control in women with type 2 diabetes and one of the reasons is the resulting loss of both abdominal subcutaneous and visceral fat. So gaining fat is a risk factor, exercise gets rid of fat, that's one of the ways in which it really helps glucose control in A1C levels. Prevention is the best option, and research shows that regular exercise can reduce the risk of, of type 2 diabetes by as much as 51%. 
While weight loss has been cited as the most important factor in reducing the risk, increased physical activity has a positive effect even when weight loss goals are not achieved. The U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program randomized over 3,200 adults with impaired glucose tolerance or impaired fasting glucose into three groups. One group took metformin, one engaged in lifestyle modification, and a control group. Lifestyle, including exercise, had a greater effect than metformin on reducing the risk of de developing diabetes. In other words, exercise is better than drugs, you guys. So again, get out there and move around. It has an immediate effect, and I think that's one of the things that I like about promoting diet and lifestyle uh, changes is that the effect is so rapid. For example, just one week of aerobic training can improve insulin sensitivity, and that's significantly greater than the effect of any drug that's taken for just one week. Getting started is the key, and that's obviously the biggest problem because so many people have formed the habit of being so sedentary. But no formal classes, memberships, or paid assistance of any type is necessary. Research shows that just fast walking can reduce the risk and contribute to lower glucose levels. Anybody with a good pair of shoes and a desire to get better can just walk out the front door and start improving his health. And we could probably film a video clip and write an article on this, this topic, exercise, and any disease, reducing the risk of cancer, reducing the risk of heart disease, and et cetera, et cetera. So get out there and move. Okay, I have to say that this next thing I'm gonna share with you is one of the most interesting things I've found in a long time. So people who have trouble sleeping, they cite a number of reasons for it, but the one I wanna focus on is the person who says, I have trouble sleeping because I can't fall asleep because my mind is distracted and I start thinking about all these things as soon as I lay down. So what they tell me is, I'm tired, I'm ready to go to bed, I'm looking for, forward to sleeping, and then I lay on the bed and I start to feel restless and I can't go to sleep. It's almost as soon as they hit the bed, their minds become cluttered with things to remember to do the next day, or reviewing things that are going on at work, and that sort of thing. This can go on for a really long time, and it really stresses people out when they can't sleep, because you feel awful the next day, and just thinking about that is stressful. So, and of course the, the bad part about that is all the stuff that you're laying in bed ruminating about, when you're sleep deprived, you're less able to deal with any of it when you get up in the morning and go to work. So there's both an explanation and a solution for the problem. So I'm gonna try and pronounce this woman's name right. It's Bluma Wolfovna Zygamik. All right, she's a Russian psychiatrist who made an interesting discovery in the 1920s quite by accident. Waiters at a restaurant were able to keep very good track of lots of different orders and unpaid bills for their restaurant patrons, but they were unable to recall almost any details for these orders, for the, the orders that had been filled and paid for. So she was curious, what causes you to keep in the front of your mind so many details on so many orders, but a person who paid you five minutes ago, you can't remember anything about the transaction. So she started doing some research to identify what was going on in her lab. In one study, children were asked to complete a list of simple tasks and puzzles and math problems. And then when half of the things that they were supposed to do were completed, they were interrupted. After an hour, almost all of the kids had a better memory of the unfinished tasks than those that they had completed. She also did these experiments in adults and she found very similar things. Those, um, those adults, the adults in her experiments, had 90% better recall of unfinished rather than finished tasks. It actually became known as the zygomic effect and it's been confirmed by other researchers, including researchers who looked at the zygomic effect on sleep. Okay, it can, the zygomic effect can have an effect on sleep. For example, a study of 59 employees who were watched over a 12 week period of time showed that unfinished tasks at work led to rumination, which in turn interfered with sleep. And this went on even during the weekends when people were not going to work. So how can this information be used to help an individual to sleep better? Some people will sleep better, if they, and particularly the people who have this type of thing going on, if they take the time before going to bed every night to evaluate their day, look at the calendar, make a to-do list, and prepare notes for the next day's activities, including those that relate to unfinished tasks. Taking the time to write in a diary about ongoing family issues or proposed plans of actions or things, the projects that you're working on at work, that's a really good idea too. Then close the appointment book, close out screens on the computer, put the lists in a prominent place where they'll be easily noticed in the morning, and place a paper and pen at the bedside in case a great idea comes to you in the middle of the night it can be very helpful. The message these activities sends to the brain are things like, I'm prepared for tomorrow, I have a plan, 
I thought through my options. Now I can process this information while I sleep and I'll wake up tomorrow with even better ideas. Try it. I do this myself and I've suggested this to a whole lot of our members who complain that this is something that affects them. And almost all of them have come back and said, you know, since I started doing it, I don't know if it's a placebo effect or if it's the, you know, just the action of closing things down that's sending this message to the brain. But whatever it is, I'm finding that I go to sleep better. I don't necessarily wake up often. I've got the paper by my bed in case I do, but I don't wake up. And, um, and getting a good night's sleep, as I said earlier, this will prepare you to deal with all the unfinished things and stuff you're stressing about the next day. So try it. Let me know how it works for you. That's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Tuesday with more news.